You know, as I was thinking about this passage of scripture during the week, just one thing came to my mind and I just blurted it out. This is it. This is it. It's all I blurted out. See, this is the core, the essential, you know, the governing factor that, that towers over all else. Do you, do you remember that uh, epic trilogy, The Lord of the Rings? Do you remember that, that uh, movie, the, the three of them? They had the famous phrase in that show, one ring to rule them all. You remember that? One ring to rule them all refers to the fact that that one ring governs all others. Well, as Jesus states these foremost commandments, we see here commandments that, in essence, govern them all. They govern all others because we come to the essential nature of God and the recognition and the realisation, of course, that God is love. God created man to be in relationship with himself. And unfortunately, this understanding has got lost over the various times where, where men and women made a, uh, a relationship with God to be based on something other than the nature of God, that is love. Now, it may have been about rules, you know, which when we drill down further, probably find that it had more to do with control and power. That's not to say that rules have their place, but some people find that by living by rules is, is actually a lot easier than loving God with all their heart, soul, mind and strength. You see, people can control the rules, whereas, you know, we cannot control our relationship with God and that makes them feel both vulnerable and insecure. Now, it may have been about love, which when we drill down to it further, probably find that it had more to do with actually sentimentality or emotionalism than love. Of course, love has its place, but true love, as opposed to, you know, the sentimentality and emotional wrappings. And you see such emotional and sentimentality being used manipulatively, manipulatively, uh, in an effort of reduction. What do I mean by reduction? I mean by reducing or watering down the demands of God. So, for example, whether it's euthanasia or, or abortion, emotional sentiment, the, the emotional sentimentalist will focus only on the present distress of a person without consideration of the long-term effects of the such short-sighted decision-making there. So the sentimentalist focuses on felt needs rather than real needs and distorts the truth of what is really important. This person will lessen moral injunctions or overlook those injunctions because, you know, they see a person struggling. Now, sure, we don't like to see people struggling, but fighting against sin Struggling against sin is always going to be a struggle. And to suggest that love somehow overshadows the struggle against sin is simply wrong. Yes, indeed, love does cover a multitude of sins, but it doesn't give permission to, uh, to, permission to sin as the, you know, the emotional sentimentalist would do. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, Quote, love does not delight in unrighteousness. Note that, but rejoices with the truth. Love cannot promote unrighteousness. So when Jesus says to the woman caught in the act of adultery, neither do I condemn you, go leave your life of sin, right? The sentimentalist would change those words to, oh, go register your new relationship. So it's important that we avoid all extremes, that we give true recognition to what's really at the heart of God's concern. And, you know, this passage today will allow us to see ever so clearly what is the heart of God. Wanting to know the main thing. Hmm. Here's a little article I picked out. 
this week. 76 year old woman who was declared dead at a hospital in Ecuador banged on her coffin during her own wake and was rescued by her son and other mourners, says the article. Quote, after about five hours of the wake, the coffin started to make sounds. I bet you they tied out of there. My mum was wrapped in sheets and hitting the coffin. And when we approached, we could see that she was breathing heavily. What an amazing thing to happen. What a surprise. Surprised to find that your mum's not dead after all. You know, uh, you look at this passage today, and uh, as we have uh, been looking at all the negativity and all the gloom from those religious leaders who really wanted to bury Jesus, literally, we're pleasantly shocked now by one wise scribe, like come out of the blue, who happily agrees with Jesus and is pleased with his response. What an amazing turn of events. And this scribe recognised amongst the usual hot, hostile scribes that Jesus answered the other religious leaders well. It says that he heard them arguing and disputing. Think about that. Jesus was in debate and was disputing with them. I find this interesting. You know, all too often we kind of think that, oh, if we debate or if we have disagreements with people, you know, that we're sinning. But that's not necessarily so. Jesus debated and disputed with these religious leaders. Now, we don't know what prompted this scribe to ask Jesus his question, but it was somewhat a question that had been discussed among the rabbis. We started with the Pharisees and Herodians trying to trap Jesus with a political question. After losing, they passed the baton on to the Sadducees who posed a theological question on the resurrection of the dead. And after answering them well, according to this scribe, he asked now a legal question about what is the most important law of all. Now, according to the scribes, there are 613 separate commandments in the Pentateuch. If you remember, I mentioned the Pentateuch last week. That's the first five books of the law, first five books of Moses. And on this question, the rabbis have various things to say. Now, in the Babylonian Talmud, that's a compilation of discussions, debates, and commentary that began while the Israelites were living in exile in Babylon. One position was that Proverbs 3 verse 6 is the ground on which the principles of the law depend. So you all know this one fairly well, I would imagine. Uh, verse 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding is well known. But verse 6 was the one they came up with where it says, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. It's about acknowledging Yahweh God in everything. There was another comment that came from a query to Rabbi Shammai and Hillel from someone who requested this quote teach me the whole law while i'm standing on one leg uh, to which hillel replied quote do not do what is hateful to you this is the whole law the rest is commentary somewhat similar to what jesus said isn't it in matthew 7 verse 12 where he says in everything therefore treat people the same way you want them to treat you for this is the law and the prophets so to a degree, they tried to drill the law down to a guiding principle. But, you know, we have no knowledge of any Jewish text outside the New Testament of putting the first commandment, the foremost commandment, to love God, and the second, to love one's neighbour together. Only in Jesus do we find those, uh, that principle. Now, the second point here really was kind of the hardest heading to think of and to describe this point I'm going to raise. There were many other options I thought of calling this, this point from what does the Lord require of you 
to uh, maybe the governing criteria uh, to even another I thought of, the, the main thing from which all else flows. But I actually settled on this one, how to respond to God. You know, because when push comes to shove, the bottom line on why we have been created and in the image of God as well is that we be in relationship with God. Isn't that right? I mean, so what does that look like? How do we live before God in a relationship with him? And we find that Jesus puts it succinctly here. The foremost is, hear, O Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the most important of all. The first, the foremost. The second, Jesus says, is this. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Notice these two commandments have a vertical and a horizontal dimension to them. To love your neighbour is horizontal, human to human, whilst to love God is vertical, us to God. And these laws that Jesus referred to here come from the Pentateuch, or the Jews call it Torah, you know, the first five books of the Old Testament. And these verses that Jesus described here come from Deuteronomy and Leviticus. So we have Leviticus first, chapter 19, verse 18, where it says, you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbour as yourself. I am the Lord. And, of course, lest an, an Israelite asks, well, who is my neighbour? Uh, we have this explicitly here from verse 34. The stranger who resides with you shall be to you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself. For you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Now, I'm sure you're thinking about, you know, Jesus' explanation of the parable of the Good Samaritan, and you would be right. So the questioner was asking the wrong question, though, in that parable. It's not who is my neighbour, but what sort of a neighbour am I? That's really what he should be asking of himself. So the apostles in the New Testament pick up on Jesus' teaching here of loving your neighbour, and they emphasise the point that if you love your neighbour, you are fulfilling the law. So Paul in Galatians, he says, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word in this statement, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. Again, the apostle James calls it the royal law. So there, now you know. If someone asks you, well, what's the royal law? You're going to know it. Right? If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbour as yourself, you are doing well. Now, we must realise, too, that this horizontal command is only one command, not two. Love your neighbour as yourself. So the imperative, the command, is to love your neighbour the indicative is what is already true as you love yourself. So there here is no command to love yourself. It's already assumed. And generally speaking, the scriptures indicate that we do it all too well, <laughs> far too well. And so unlike so many nowadays who follow secular psychologies, their self-esteem doctrine, the emphasis that Jesus gives here is to loving one's neighbour. The fact that he says, as yourself, would absolutely collapse the scriptural teaching if humanity falls short on loving themselves. True? The imperative is founded on the indicative 
And if there is the indicative, if it's not true, then the motivation for the imperative has been cancelled out. Do you understand that? How absurd would that be? It's like turning the scripture upside down. It contradicts the plain teaching that every person does indeed love themselves. So if you get it, if you didn't love yourself, then what Jesus is saying is absolutely useless. What basis would you have to love others if you don't love yourself? It just ruins and cancels out Jesus' command completely. This is why he says and highlights, love your neighbor. And really, until we come to understand this for what it is, humanity is going to continue down a self-centered path. I mean, is it not interesting that when Jesus addressed the rich young ruler, that he only mentioned the second parts of the Decalogue, which is the second part of the Ten Commandments. They call that the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, right? And this is what he says. He says to him, you know, the commandments do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honour your father and your mother. So they're the second ones of the Decalogue. You could say, or he, he could say there, that he'd kept all those since he was a youth. How good is that? But how did he go with the first part of the Decalogue, the first part of the Ten Commandments, where it deals with the vertical aspect, the relationship with God? Not so good as it seems, since his wealth had actually become a God to him. And so he refused to give it up on the promise of better things even from Jesus, resulting from personally following Jesus. And he missed out. So now we come to the first and the vertical command. And Jesus says it's more weightier command than the second one of loving your neighbour. Not that we are pitting one against the other here. Of course, that would be absurd. But there is a priority to note. And you know what? I think you could argue that without the first being first, the second is going to make little sense. I mean, after all, if God created humanity, then humanity will only properly function when it properly relates to the God who created them. Wouldn't that make sense? So from Deuteronomy chapter 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. These words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. So it's pretty obvious that to love God means to love him with all our being. Mark records Jesus as stating the Shema. Now, that's the preface here, which is very highly regarded by the Jewish community and right throughout history. Shema means to hear. Hear, O Israel. Israel is to hear. But the Jews always understood that it probably meant obey, right? not just hear and do nothing about it, but hear and obey, carry out what the Lord is saying. The Lord is our God. The Lord is one. This here is an absolute statement of monotheism. No other gods, period. Deuteronomy. To you, it was shown that you might know that Yahweh, he is God, and that there is no other besides him. In Isaiah, declare and set forth your case. Indeed, let them consult together. Who has announced this from of old? Who has long since declared it? Is it not I, the Lord, that is Yahweh? And there is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a saviour. There is none except me. And so after hearing this clearly, it still befuddles us, really, that many within Israel still went after the gods of other nations. What then is the response to this acknowledgement of the only one 
God? Well, the response is you are to love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you know, it says in 1 John 4 verse 8 that, quote, the one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And that love is seen through the sending of his son, Jesus. This love that we are to have for God covers a lot of areas, doesn't it? Heart, soul, mind, strength is what it says in today's passage of Scripture. However, you know what? It's not consistent wherever this reference is quoted. And you will find slight degrees of differences, but none that really change the meaning of what this scripture is saying. That's a little small, I'm sorry, but here we can see some examples of it. So Deuteronomy 6 verse 5 says, heart, soul, might. And the second line down, the Septuagint, that's the Greek version of the Old Testament scriptures written prior to Christ, says whole mind, whole soul, whole strength. We go to our passage today, of course, is heart, soul, mind, and strength. If we go to Matthew's gospel for a parallel passage there, heart, soul, mind. If you go to Luke, it's heart, soul, strength, mind. And the scribe's reply to today's passage was heart, understanding, strength. They're all different, aren't they? Well, a lot of them. But really, however, it's conveying here that every part of our being should love God. The heart in scripture is not predominantly how you feel as modern Western culture is using it. The heart has more to do with the mind, except it goes deeper, goes into those areas of motivation. Notice above that the heart is not there in the Greek's Septuagint but the mind is, that's LXX, by the way, the mind is there. The mind is the thinking processes where you reason and where you rationalize, but the heart is about the seat of your decision-making, right? You think with your heart and the decisions you make can stem from the heart. The heart thinks, and many of its thoughts would probably never surface as people might be embarrassed about what they think being made known. <laughs> Remember what Jesus said here as we go back to Mark chapter 7. He says this, he says, from within, out of the heart of man, proceed what? Evil thoughts. That's coming from the heart, right? Evil thoughts, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride and foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. Now, this is not to say here that the heart of man cannot have noble thoughts proceeding from it. But here, of course, Jesus was dealing with the religious leaders who were only thinking that uncleanliness had to do with what you touched or ingested. But Jesus says that real uncleanliness, real defilement actually comes from the heart. So the heart is the decision-making processes that you have in your life that reveals your motivations and things like that. Love the Lord with all your heart. We also love the Lord with all our mind, it says. Now, I've heard people disparage knowledge as if it's against faith or at least some notion of, oh, the simple faith. Can't get too much knowledge. It ruins our faith. I mean, that's patently and dangerously false. Knowledge and faith are not counter to each other. They're actually complementary. So the Apostle Peter, he says, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul in the book of Romans, he says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Love the Lord with all your mind. But he also says to love him with your strength, with your might. And, of course, strength and might, they're quite self-explanatory. But then we come to soul. Soul's an interesting one, isn't it? 
Do you know soul can be interpreted differently by whether you're a Greek or a Hebrew? Soul is usually spoken as in our scriptures from a Hebrew background. And we can do no better than see the reference here as meaning life itself, life itself. So you don't have a soul as the Greeks would have it. You are a soul. And there's a big difference there. This is the way the Hebrews understood it. You are a soul. You don't have one. It's not some little thing residing within you. You are a soul. The soul is not some individual part. The soul is you as a living being. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. It's very, very explicit here. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground. He breathed into his nostrils the breath or the spirit of life. And the man became a living being, right? That in the old translations was living soul. And whilst it literally means living soul, all translations now use the word living beings because they recognize that the soul is not something you have, but that you are. You are a soul. You are in your totality a living soul, a living being. Right? And so when Jesus says that the foremost commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your soul, it is an all-encompassing word that means with your whole being, your whole life. Now, it's vital to have this understanding of the vertical dimension, to love God and the horizontal to love your neighbour, firmly placed in the core of your thinking as central to your beliefs and your values, that system of beliefs and values as you know it. You've got a little diagram here. I've constructed what I've called this web of beliefs. It's a diagram to show you that your core beliefs hold all your other values together consistently, right? Your core beliefs right in the middle there. And this one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, ought to be there in the core of your beliefs. And all the other values sort of stem from that. But then, of course, what happens if your core belief is wrong or corrupt and it breaks? What does it do? It impacts a great deal of many other areas, many other value systems that you have many values, it could corrupt them too. I'm going to put a copy of this on Telegram and the newsletter for you to reflect on. But it's vital to see love in conjunction with actions. Love is not just something, a superficial and emotional attitude. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength is going to move you to righteousness. Okay, like Josiah, as we saw before, who was one of the three kings that got the full approval of the Lord with no exceptions to their good conduct. Let's read a little bit of Josiah here. It says, moreover, Josiah removed the mediums, the spiritists, and the teraphim, and the idols, and all the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem, that he might confirm the words of the law which were written in the book of that, that Hilkiah, the priest found in the house of the Lord. Before him there was no king like him, note, who turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might. That's straight out of Deuteronomy, by the way. According to all the law of Moses, nor did any like him arise after him. You know that? His righteous actions were not in conflict with his total love of the Lord with all his heart, soul, mind and strength. Rather, they extended from that love. He took action based on that love that he had for the Lord. So Deuteronomy again says, you shall therefore love the Lord your God and always keep his charge, his statutes, his ordinances and his commandments. So we come to our concluding point. So this scribe gets it and pretty much congratulates Jesus on his answer. He affirms what Jesus says with heart, understanding, strength. Even left off soul there. 
but it's not important. It really just shows that with all the various angles, what it means with all your being to love the Lord your God and that there is no part of you that should hold back on your love for the Lord. But, of course, in a surprising twist, he brings out the fact that the vertical and the horizontal love that Jesus mentions has a higher level than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. This is a newie. I mean, as a person closely associated with the temple, that was not only a remarkable thing to say, it was also a dangerous thing to say because the temple elite are the ones going after Jesus and they are the ones obsessed with the workings of the temple, which, of course, has to do with all burnt offerings and sacrifices. Imagine him saying that. And, of course, this isn't the first time that such a comparison had been made like this. Do you remember King David after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba, um, then manslaughter, virgin, verging on murder of her husband Uriah, he made this astonishing statement too in his psalm of repentance where he says to God, for you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. A sorry heart. You know, by your favour, do good to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then young bulls will be offered on your altar. So David here says what is really most important and that it is a broken and contrite heart. In short, what he's saying is a repentant heart. The change of heart is what is all important. And we know that this is a prerequisite for reconciliation with God and for everlasting life. There has to be a repentant heart toward God. Again from Hosea, for I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice, says God, and in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. And again, King Saul, Samuel says to him, has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. So this demonstrated that this man had an understanding and a heart for God that many of his compatriots lacked. He had answered wisely as someone who was seeing. He was seeing, right? His disciples, Jesus' disciples had trouble seeing. So this guy has something going for him. However, he has not arrived, which is why I put here in the heading, proximity is not arriving. Now, I recall, you know, some of the first meals I made when I moved out of home uh, to live on my own. And I decided one night to make spaghetti bolognese. I like spaghetti, pretty good. Now, I followed my mum's recipe to a T and I prepared it how she told me to. But it turned out virtually inedible. <laughs> but where did I go wrong? Well, it just happened to be in a minor area. You see, no one bothered to tell me or explain to me that a clove of crushed garlic was one little piece of the garlic bulb and not the bulb itself. Needless to say, I never had so much as a hint of cold, flu, or the presence of vampires for the whole winter. So close, but so far away. So Jesus said to this man that he was not far from the kingdom of God. But he was not there, but he was close. And, you know, in one sense, not being in the kingdom mattered little since whether you were close or far away, you're still not in it. You had neither reconciliation with God nor everlasting life. However, he was in a good place to be able to make a right response to Jesus. You know, people come near to Jesus all the time, and there were many and many people that were around Jesus. But they must make the move themselves to accept Jesus 
personally. This guy had a great start, but he had to go further. He had to put his entire faith and trust in Jesus. And the interesting thing is, Jesus knew where this guy was in relation to himself, just like he knows where you are in relation to himself. You know, I hope this morning that if you haven't personally and publicly sided with Jesus, that you would make that move today. Don't be content to just be not far from the kingdom, because really not far is still too far, too far. So please, I'd love to talk with you later if uh, you'd like to go further than this scribe and not just uh, be near Jesus, but want to really come to him. I'm sure there'd be many others you could talk to if you would like to do that today. Thank you.